This CMS National Training Program recorded webinar provides basic information on Medicare, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP, and the Health Insurance Marketplace. You should always consult the relevant statutes, regulations, and rulings for official legal guidance. This is intended as an informational resource for partners. It isn't meant for press purposes and isn't on the record. If you're a member of the press, you can email press at cms.hhs.gov. Hello, and welcome to today's virtual workshop. Our topic is Medicare for People with End-Stage Renal Disease, or ESRD. I'm Melissa Moreno with the CMS National Training Program, or NTP. And with that, we're going to go ahead and turn things over now to our first presenter, Brenda Delgado. Brenda? Thank you, Melissa. My name is Brenda Delgado, and as Melissa said, I'm with the Chicago Regional Office, and this is one of our many trainings that we do in various formats. And really, I encourage you, as Melissa said, use the chat function. We really have a wealth of knowledge during this webinar. And although we are going to be covering um, pretty much the updates and the basics of ESRD, Definitely give us as many questions or concerns that you have about ESRD. It really helps us to have additional insight on how we can better serve you for your outreach needs. So today we're gonna to be having different lessons. I'm going to be covering lesson one and two, and then my colleague Peter is gonna be continuing with three and four. And lesson one and two is gonna be the Medicare eligibility and then Medicare enrollment based on ESRD. So really, we want to cover some of the session objectives for this portion. At the end of this session, we want you to make sure that you understand how to describe what ESRD is. Uh, we'll be using that acronym frequently, probably the majority of the time during today's presentation. End stage renal disease will specify what that actually means and how it means for specifically Medicare eligibility. We're gonna be talking about what Medicare eligibility rules are and how you enroll in Medicare when you do have ESRD. And then we're gonna go on to the specific Medicare covered services for people with ESRD. There's also probably the number one uh, question that we have is the coverage options for people with ESRD. They are specific rules and exceptions for this population. So we wanna make sure we spend some specific time on that and get all of your questions answered. And then at the very end, it's a great resource that we want to share our, our resources page, additional information. And I'll definitely add part of that. Use us as a resource for anything else that you need for ESRD, not just on today's topic of webinar, but the regional offices are also available to do specific trainings. I know Peter and I have done some ESRD conferences and we've spent much more than just this uh, brief time with participants answering specific questions. So we can certainly grow from this one-time partnership. If you're interested, definitely reach out. So starting with lesson one, I'm gonna be talking about what ESRD is and what Medicare eligibility for this population. We wanna make sure that you understand what the medical treatments are for ESRD, how the rules are different for Medicare eligibility for patients who have end-stage renal disease, and then who to contact and which agencies play what parts for questions on Medicare eligibility when you're talking for the ESRD population. So number first, number one, what is end-stage renal disease? That's when a patient has permanent kidney failure that requires a regular course of dialysis or if they're eligible for a kidney transplant. And we're gonna be speaking about some eligibility periods for both dialysis and also for kidney transplant. Um, for some of you who I noticed on the survey who are relatively new to this topic, what is dialysis? There's um, various forms of dialysis, but it's a procedure where you need to need assistance in cleaning your blood because your kidneys aren't working. So whether it's hemodialysis or um, at-home dialysis, Medicare covers those services, and it means that you have end-stage renal disease when you do need dialysis. 
There's also kidney transplants. Uh, that's the type of surgery that puts someone else's healthy kidney into your body. It also makes you eligible for Medicare. We're going to talk about those eligibility periods and services that are covered during the kidney transplant. And again, if these are topics that you want to know even further information out, definitely reach out and ask us your specific questions. We can go in depth and provide personalized trainings on that as well. So when you have Medicare eligibility based on ESRD, you're eligible no matter how old you are. Most people who uh, understand Medicare believe that Medicare is primarily for seniors who are over age 65, which is true. Most of our population on Medicare is based on age. Um, about a quarter or a third of the population is based on Medicare because of disability. And then a smaller portion of people on Medicare nationwide are based on eligibility because of their end stage renal disease. And they, there is no age requirement for that. The requirement is that your kidneys are no longer working, that you are either participating or eligible for dialysis, or if you are eligible for a kidney transplant. Um, it means that one of those factors need to be applicable to you. Sometimes we do have children um, young children who are eligible for Medicare based on ESRD. And it's the only time that um, minor children would be eligible for Medicare is because of this category. There are some requirements for Medicare coverage for ESRD, and that does determine whether you've worked for the required amount of time, if you already getting or are eligible to receive either Social Security or Railroad Retirement Board benefits. And if it's not you who are eligible for Medicare, it's because you are the spouse or the dependent child of a person who meets these requirements. And then sometimes the spouse has ESRD or the child has ESRD and they are receiving their Medicare benefits through their working spouse or the, per the spouse who had worked and receive that eligibility or through their parent. So it also means that um, you need to have both Medicare Part A, which is what we call hospital insurance, and you also need Part B medical insurance to really have complete coverage for ESRD benefits. Uh, the hospital insurance is what covers when you're inside the hospital um, for usually inpatient services, but Part B also has really a significant role to play to make sure that you have access to all the benefits that Medicare offers, especially when you're on ESRD, they're going to be primarily provided on an outpatient basis, including some coverage of immunosuppressive drugs or transplant drugs that are going to be really critical to make sure that you're healthy if you have ESRD. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you need to have additional questions for Medicare eligibility, these are the two federal agencies that oversee the enrollment and eligibility of Medicare. Um, it's the same for Medicare based on age or disability or ESRD. The majority of people are contacting Social Security, their website, ssa.gov. We try to keep it simple to remember. Their phone number, 1-800-772-1213. Also a TTY number available. And then if it applies to your situation or yourself or your family, railroad retirees would be contacting the Railroad Retirement Board. Those are the two federal agencies that are um, responsible to determine your enrollment and eligibility for Medicare, seeing if you've worked enough credit hours, work credits, um, and determine your enrollment process. You may be also able to get help from Medicaid. Medicaid is the health insurance program that is offered um, partnership with the federal government, but administered by each individual state for people who are of low income and low resources. And so if that fits your criteria, your scenario, we encourage you to reach out to your state Medicaid agency to see if there are programs and assistance that they can help pay for your dialysis treatments or even pay for some of your Medicare uh, premiums and co-pays as well. Each single state agency has uh, their own Medicaid program, uh, Medicaid, uh, is different in every single state. 
And so the main resource that we want you to connect with, if you think you want to uh, see if you're eligible for Medicaid is talk directly with your social worker or your hospital or even your dialysis facility. They have assigned staff that focuses on applying and understanding these Medicaid benefits and can make sure that you are uh, submitting a complete application the first time and see if you're eligible for Medicaid. Uh, secondly, you can also contact directly your state Medicaid office. Uh, your state Medicaid office has uh, online assistance as well, online applications. Um, if it's not feasible for you to visit in person, there are many other ways to contact your state Medicaid agency, including, of course, be on their website, their 800 number, but it would be individual time. Um, for the first one, I will turn it over to Melissa to have the question of your knowledge check. Thanks, Melissa. Oh, thank you very much, Brenda. And it looks like some of you are already jumping in. It is time for our first knowledge check question, which is what is the minimum age requirement for Medicare eligibility based on end-stage renal disease or ESRD? Is it A, there's no minimum age requirement, B, 55, C, age 65, or D, age 75? And it looks like most of you have go ahead and answered this as A, there's no minimum age requirement. That was 98% of you. And that is correct. And you'll recall Brenda covered this pretty, pretty thoroughly. Um, you can get Medicare no matter how old you are. If your kidneys no longer work, you need regular dialysis. And one of these applies to you. You've worked the required amount of time under Social Security, the Railroad Retirement Board, or RRB, or as a government employee, or you're already getting or are eligible for Social Security or RRB benefits, or you're the spouse or dependent child of a person who meets either of the requirements already described. So good job. I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over to Brenda. Thank you, Melissa. Now we're going to be going on to lesson two, what the Medicare enrollment process looks like for those patients who are diagnosed with end-stage renal disease and summarizing what you're going to be covering during this lesson. We're going to be explaining what the Medicare enrollment process is, how it is different for ESRD patients. We're going to also be talking about Medicare and how it coordinates coverage with group health plans. Uh, there's also other enrollment considerations that are specific for people with ESRD. And then explain the rules for when Medicare ESRD coverage starts, continues, when it can resume, and when does it end. Um, I know this is just one of the lessons that we're going to be covering today, but I would say it was probably the meat of our presentation. And if we are still uh, having questions beyond today, definitely look at the training materials that are in the chat for downloading all of these materials. You can review them again at your leisure and also reaching out to the training team for additional resources or training opportunities. So this is the form that you would be submitting to Social Security. It is called the CMS 2728 form, but you don't submit it to CMS. You submit it to Social Security because Social Security is our sister agency that determines your enrollment and processes, uh, determines your eligibility and processes your enrollment in Medicare. Um, so this is what you would be having filled out with your either doctor or dialysis facility. They fill it out and then they also uh, work with you to turn that into Social Security. Um, it's a standard process for them, so they are very familiar with it. Uh, so it's not something that you need to be doing by yourself. Your provider uh, of care, either doctor or dialysis facility, will be helping you, you with that. And that helps you enroll and get coverage under both Medicare Part A and Medicare Part B. So there is a correlation between entitlement to Medicare based on ESRD, different than it is for age and different than people who are based on disability, eligibility for Medicare. So when you have Medicare due to age or disability and then you develop ESRD, your entitlement is based on ESRD can eliminate your Part B penalty. 
Some scenarios, people are enrolling in Medicare, let's say, for example, at age 65, um, and they may not have enrolled in Part B when they were uh, first eligible for Part B at age 65. Maybe for various reasons, they were healthy and didn't want to pay that Part B premium because everybody does pay that Part B premium, uh, usually out of their Social Security check. And maybe they didn't enroll at that time, even though it is very important to have Part B because it gives you complete coverage for much of your medical health care, including mainly outpatient services, preventive services, labs. But some people choose not to enroll. When they do enroll in Part B late, then they have a Part B penalty. Um, that is because they did not enroll when they were first eligible. Well, when you are then already in Medicare and then you become eligible for uh, Medicare because of ESRD, you get a new in, in, uh, initial enrollment period. We call it the IEP. And because you have an initial enrollment period, once you are uh, eligible for Medicare due to ESRD, it wipes out any previous penalty that you may have been having to pay for a late Part B enrollment. This is going to be uh, then automatic, but it is really helpful for people who may have delayed for even maybe more than one year or two years and are paying a significant penalty. Maybe they went on for several years without Part B, and that's a great opportunity to uh, have Medicare without that Part B penalty. Now, some people have Medicare due to ESRD first because they were before age 65, and then they reach 65. For those people, Medicare is gonna continue coverage without any gap in coverage. Uh, you will have continuous coverage from the day before you turn 65, including right after as you turn 65. It's just that in our records, your eligibility criteria has shifted, and now you're eligible on Medicare because of your age. Um, it really doesn't change much of your benefits. If you don't have Part B when you had ESRD and then you reach 65, you will be signed up for it automatically by Social Security. And then you can take the action and decision if you want to keep Part B. Again, it is required to have a complete Medicare coverage, but it is your choice if you want to disenroll from it. And if they wanted to disenroll, they can go ahead and take that action and disenroll through Social Security. In the same scenario, if you were first eligible for Medicare due to ESRD, and now you are shifting into eligibility because of age, because you've reached 65, and you were previously paying a late enrollment penalty for Part B, once again, you are now eligible for a new second initial enrollment period. And in the same scenario as before, you will have your penalty waived for Part B. So when Medicare coverage starts based on ESRD, the cover Medicare coverage would start the first day of the fourth month if you are receiving uh, dialysis in a dialysis facility. Now, it's a little different if you are receiving home dialysis training uh, because then your eligibility for Medicare coverage is going to start on the first month that you're participating in a home dialysis training program. Um, during the first three months of your regular course of dialysis, expecting that you're going to be completing that training. Now, there's also eligibility for Medicare if you are getting a kidney transplant. If you're getting a kidney transplant, Medicare coverage also starts on the first day of the month. Also, if you're admitted to a Medicare certified hospital for a kidney transplant, and I will say great majority of hospitals who are doing kidney transplants are in a Medicare certified facility in a hospital that's Medicare certified. Uh, so that's just more of a disclaimer. And for healthcare services that you need before your transplant, if your transplant takes place in the same month or within the next two months, that in that scenario, your Medicare coverage will start that same month that you're admitted to that hospital. Now, if your transplant happens to be delayed more than two months after you've been admitted to the hospital for the transplant or for other healthcare services that you need before the transplant, your Medicare coverage would be eligible, would be starting two months before the month of your transplant. Now, there is a very uh, critical note that we want to highlight. If you're eligible for Medicare based on ESRD and you happen to not have signed up right away, 
you could be eligible for 12 months of retroactive coverage once you have Medicare. So let's say, for example, that you were eligible for Medicare coverage based on ESRD, let's say in February, but you didn't enroll in Medicare until November. When that enrollment is processed, it, can be, it will be retroactive to February because you were eligible for Medicare uh, back in February, and it could go up to 12 months retro. Now, when does Medicare coverage for ESRD, when does it end and when does it continue? Medicare coverage does end for people who have ESRD if that's the only reason why they have Medicare coverage. So that means that they are not on Medicare because they're over age 65. They are not on Medicare because they were determined to be disabled by Social Security and have been disabled for more than 24 months. If it's the only reason why they're on Medicare because of ESRD, Medicare coverage ends 12 months a year after the month you no longer need a course of dialysis or 36 months, three years, after the month of your successful kidney transplant. Now, again, very um, it's not rare in this population that sometimes their Medicare coverage ends and then they have either complications or their transplant is no longer successful. And so coverage would continue without interruption and no application is necessary if you start a regular course of dialysis again, or if you get a transplant within the 12 months after regular dialysis stopped, or if you started a regular course of dialysis, or if you got another transplant within the 36 months after transplant. So those are scenarios when Medicare coverage would be continuous. Now, if Medicare coverage starts, um, if you start and resume dialysis or get another kidney transplant, that means that there's a new individual enrollment period, again, starting. Every time that there's, remember, a new IEP that also wipes out any applicable Part B penalty, late enrollment penalty that you may be uh, applying to your enrollment. Uh, you can also sign up again under the same conditions that we just described previously in the first lesson. There's also no premium pen penalty, as I stated, for, lading, for later enrollment, again, because you do have that new IEP. But you do, you must file another application, the same application that we covered previously that you turn into Social Security. Because remember, Social Security is the federal agency that processes and determines your eligibility and enrollment in Medicare. So there's also uh, Medicare and group health plan coverage. You're, if you have group health plan or employer coverage or union coverage, and if they are the only payer during your first three months of dialysis, once you get Medicare coverage based on ESRD, your employer plan or your group health plan pays first on your hospital bills and your medical bills for 30 months and Medicare pays second. That's called the coordination period. That coordination period goes on for 30 months. Um, in the regular month of dialysis, remember Medicare does not start until the fourth month of dialysis. So that means those first three months of dialysis, if you have employer coverage, your employer is covering and paying first uh, for those um, for, for that dialysis. And then starting on the fourth month, Medicare is going to be paying second during the next four to 30 months of Medicare eligibility. Every single time that you maybe had a previous eligibility for Medicare because of ESRD, and maybe you had a successful transplant, and then uh, years down the line, you have uh, another need for another transplant. You're going to be having a new eligibility period again for Medicare. There's a separate 30 month coordination period each time that you sign up for Medicare based on ESRD. If you're covered by a group health plan, you have, let's go over these two options. You can get Medicare during the 30 month coordination period. Remember Medicare is paying secondary um, and maybe you want to have that Medicare coverage paid secondary because maybe your group health plan, your employer plan has a large yearly deductible, or it will help with your co-pays or your co-insurance. So even though your group health plan or employer plan is paying first 
during that coordination period, there still may be significant out-of-pocket cost for the patient. And Medicare, a secondary payer, could certainly be helping with those costs um, if you're enrolled in Medicare during the coordination period. Also, Medicare can help pay for the immunosuppressive drugs. Um, immunosuppressive drugs are definitely critical, but they may be very expensive, and your coverage under your group health plan or your union employer plan um, may not be uh, complete coverage, and there may be significant um, costs that Medicare could help with for your immunosuppressive drugs. Another sometimes unique feature to Medicare coverage under transplant is Medicare does cover the living donor and it's, it's, it's significant coverage for that living donor. Not all other types of insurance offer that level of coverage. And so in considering preparing for a transplant, that may be something that you may want to uh, have as an option to, to use before your transplant to cover the costs for the living donor. There's also another option. You could delay applying for Medicare until after the 30-month coordination period ends. Uh, some of those reasons may be if you delay signing up for Part A and Part B, you can sign up anytime without waiting or without penalty. That's fine. Uh, everyone does pay for that Part B premium, uh, every monthly premium, and some people may decide that that's not uh, the best choice for them. But if you do sign up for Part A, and you delay enrollment in Part B, then you can't sign up for Part B until the next general enrollment period. Um, and then you may also be paying a penalty. Um, so certainly make sure that maybe you are asking those specific questions, thinking about those options very carefully. Reach out to advice, either calling through 1-800-MEDICARE or reaching out to our uh, senior health insurance program, our SHIPS, who, are, who provide free assistance for people through their Medicare choices, or maybe reaching out to your ESRD network uh, to make sure that you're making the best informed choice for you. If you do sign up for Part A um, or for both Part A and Part B, you could also delay enrolling in Part D, D like David, D for drugs. Uh, that's what Medicare Part D covers is your outpatient prescription drugs. If you have other credible drug, drug coverage, that credible drug coverage may very well be from your group health plan, union, employer plan. If you don't get Part D, or if you have other credible drug coverage, you could pay a penalty if, in, if you enroll in Part D later. Uh, very similar to uh, Part B, late enrollment coverage. Um, those are also sometimes complicated decisions that are best had with all the information and make sure you understand it. Take some time and make sure that you understand what your choices are. Uh, there's also considerations about the transplant drugs. Uh, again, the transplant drugs are, are life-saving, necessary, and sometimes uh, expensive, uh, depending on your coverage. So if you have Medicare Part B, and if you're only eligible for Medicare because of ESRD, Part B will only cover your transplant drugs if you had Part A at the time of your transplant, and you had transplant surgery at a Medicare certified facility. Now under Part B, Medicare pays 80% of that cost and the patient pays 20% of the cost for those prescription drugs. If you are having Medicare drug coverage, the coverage under Part D, like drugs, if you don't meet the conditions for Part B coverage of transplant drugs, you may be able to get coverage by signing up for drug coverage, but it's really critical to understand drug coverage will not cover transplant drugs if they would be covered by Part B if you had it. So really these coverage decisions are, um, are, are really necessary to understand. Take your time, ask questions, reach out to uh, Medicare, 1-800-MEDICARE, our uh, ESRD networks or our SHIPS to make sure that you're making the best well-informed choice for your own specific situation. Um, another little highlight I wanna add, if you do have drug coverage, your Part B coinsurance cost don't count towards your Part D catastrophic coverage. Um, we do also cover this topic in our Part D uh, drug Medicare drug coverage uh, training manual, which is also available on our website. 
it does go into this in depth um, and certainly other resources at the very end will be helpful for this too. There is a new immunosuppressive drug benefit that just started last year. Um, hopefully if you're working in this space, uh, you are already aware of it. Medicare benefit will continue to pay for immunosuppressive drugs beyond the 36 months if you don't have any other healthcare coverage. So remember coverage is uh, for immunosuppressive drugs um, is, is really critical and you need to make sure that you understand how you're going to continue that coverage. This new coverage is only for immunosuppressive drugs and is offered under Medicare Part B, which we also call medical insurance. It's available if your Medicare coverage ends or will end 36 months after the month in which you got a successful kidney transplant. Because remember, Medicare coverage ends three years after your kidney transplant. Um, and you may not be enrolled in certain other types of coverage. So that means you cannot have coverage for immunosuppressive drugs under a union plan, group health plan, employer plan, or even if you are enrolled in Medicaid. Um, and so you are uh, attesting to that. And if there is a change in your circumstances and you do receive coverage uh, from somewhere else after you are enrolled in this new Medicare immunosuppressive drug benefit, you must let Medicare know within 60 days that now you maybe have new coverage available so that you can disenroll from this new uh, Part B benefit. Um, some of those features for this new immunosuppressive drug benefit under Medicare Part B, there are no specific enrollment periods. You can enroll or disenroll any time of the year. Uh, that is very unique. So we want to make sure that we highlight that. The benefit only covers immunosuppressive drugs. Um, so this is an option that you are electing just to get Medicare Part B coverage for your immunosuppressive drugs. You are required to attest that you don't have other coverage and you don't expect to get other coverage uh, for your health coverage. The premium for this benefit is less than the standard Part B premium because it's only covering uh, your immunosuppressive drugs and enrollees will not be subject to late enrollment penalties. Uh, this is really understanding that having coverage for your immunosuppressive drugs after transplant is really critical. So taking advantage of this is certainly something that we want to uh, highlight and share widely um, and make sure that if you're working in this space with ESRD patients, that they're made aware of this opportunity. And if they need it, it is there for them. Uh, you're also maybe eligible for certain Medicare savings programs. We call them MSPs. Um, the MSPs uh, help pay for your Medicare premiums, co-pays, deductibles, uh, co-insurance amounts, and uh, it can help pay for that Medicare Part B premium, including this new immunosuppressive drug benefit. Um, with that, I'll turn it again over to Melissa for a knowledge check. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you so much, Brenda. Okay, let's have our second knowledge check poll, which is for those with Medicare due to end-stage renal disease or ESRD, who also have an employer or union group health plan or GHP, the employer or union group health plan must pay first for how many months? Do you remember? Is it A, 20 months, B, 30 months, C, 36 months, or D, 60 months? The answer is B. In general, Medicare is the secondary payer of benefits for the first 30 months of Medicare eligibility, known as the 30-month coordination period for people with ESRD who have employer or union group health plan coverage. Well done. So let's go to our next knowledge check poll, which is... If you're getting a regular course of dialysis in a Medicare-approved facility, when will your Medicare coverage based on ESRD start? Is it A, the first day of the next month, B, the first day of the fourth month of dialysis, C, 60 days after dialysis begins, or D, 30 days after dialysis begins? The correct answer is B, the first day of the fourth month of dialysis. Medicare coverage will begin on the first day of the fourth month of a regular course of dialysis. 
Very good. We're now going to turn things over to our second presenter, Mr. Peter Bauer, to take us through the remainder of our presentation. Peter? Thank you very, very much, Melissa. Um, I'm going to start with lesson three. What does Medicare cover as far as ESRD? So our objectives are um, describing the treatment options for end-stage renal disease, explain the Medicare coverage for dialysis services and supplies, explain Medicare coverage for home dialysis training and equipment, and explain Medicare coverage for kidney transplants. I already saw a couple of questions already asking about kidney transplants, what should you do? Um, and explain um, Medicare coverage for ambulance transportation for dialysis. So as a family enters into a family member having end-stage renal disease, there are treatment options we all need to know about. Um, are you gonna get hemodialysis? Are you gonna get peritoneal dialysis? Are you gonna get a kidney transplant or can you get a kidney transplant or your candidate? And then there's also the concept of conservative uh, management of your end state or your loved one's end stage renal disease. So there are two treatment options uh, as far as dialysis is concerned. There's two, um, one is hemodialysis, and I've got a wonderful picture on the screen right now um, where, uh, you know, they, they, uh, where hemodialysis happens. And then you have peritoneal dialysis where uh, the, my, again, the picture on the right is an example of the peritoneal dialysis. Common dialysis grubs, drugs that are covered by Medicare as heparin, protamine, um, the topical anesthetics, and uh, um, erythroprotein uh, simulating agents, or ESA. So the covered dialysis service, what's covered? So you have Medicare Part A, which is our hospital insurance, covers the inpatient dialysis treatments. When you're going to the, um, when you go into the hospital, they get your uh, dialysis treatments. And then Medicare Part B, um, medical insurance, covers the outpatient dialysis treatments and the doctor services, the home dialysis training if you're doing peritoneal um, uh, dialysis. Um, home dialysis equipment and supplies, because there's going to be a great many equipment and supplies associated with that. Um, certain um, home support services, um, monthly visits um, for home dialysis to, you know, help help uh, help the family uh, deal with the home dialysis process. Um, most of the drugs for outpatient or home dialysis are covered and other services and supplies that are part of your dialysis treatment. Um, and then dialysis treatment um, when you travel throughout the United States. Um, so home dialysis training equipment, I'd like to spend some time on right now. So part B covers uh, the training for home dialysis but it only by a certified facility. Uh, a doctor's approval is needed. So you got to work, the family's got to work with the patient's doctor. And the dialysis facility provides all your home dialysis related items and services, including equipment and supplies. And when you complete your home dialysis training, your Medicare coverage will start the month you begin your regular dialysis. Okay, now ambulance transportation for dialysis. Um, it's covered by original Medicare in some cases. Medicare Advantage plans and Medicaid um, may cover some non-ambulance transportation to the dialysis facility and to the doctor. For non-emergency scheduled repetitive ambulance transportation to be covered, it must be medically necessary. So that's the fine print I want to leave you all with is that the concept of medical necessity. You're going to need to have a written order from your doctor, and it must be dated no earlier than 60 days before the service. 
Dialysis services and supplies not covered by Medicare are paid dialysis aides to help you with the home dialysis. Um, lost pay to you or the person who may be helping you during the home dialysis training, and a place to stay during your treatment, at blood or packed red blood cells for home dialysis unless part of the doctor's services. So treatment options for kidney transplant. I got this great uh, visual on the um, on the right for everyone to kind of see what uh, what we're talking about here. So surgery. Uh, what what tra kidney transplant is is surgery that puts someone else's kid healthy kidney into your body or into the body of the ESR and stage renal disease patient. The donated kidneys does the work that the that the patient's own kidney can no longer do, and the blood and tissue samples for the kidney donor must be tested to see how well it's compatible or how well they match. Um, note: Medicare will cover your kidney transplant only if it's done in a hospital that's a Medicare certified kidney transplant facility. So Medicare Part A, which is fondly known as hospital insurance and your kidney transplant coverage. So Medicare Part A is gonna cover the inpatient services for a medical Medicare certified hospital. I already said that. Um, it's the kidney registration fee Medicare Part A is going to pay for, the laboratory and other tests that are needed, uh, the cost of finding the proper kidney for your transplant surgery, the full cost of the full cost of care for the kidney donor, and then any additional hospital inpatient hospital care for the donor, and then Medicare will also cover the blood bill. Um, so. Also part of Medicare is Medicare Part B. So what, what is their Medicare uh, um, medical insurance cover? The transplant, let's talk about the pa transplant patient coverage. Uh, it covers the doctor services for the kidney transplant surgery. Your kidney donor during their hospital, say, the blood, and then the immunosuppressive um, or the transplant drugs and also the transplant drugs. Medicare will pay the first, will pay the full cost of care for your kidney donor. Um, there are treatment options, and this is what we call conservative management. Treatment includes preserving the kidney function for as long as possible. Managing your symptoms like nausea, poor appetite, and your feelings, managing other health problems caused by kidney failure like anemia, maintaining the quality of life as long as possible, and then lastly, preparing for the end of life. Um, Medicare only pays for supportive services like symptom control and pain management under hospice if if certain requirements are met. Okay, well, thank you very much, Peter. We're gonna go ahead to our next um, knowledge check poll. So you'll recall Peter covered this, which service is covered by part A? Is it A, a place to stay during your dialysis treatments? B, the cost of finding the proper kidney for your transplant surgery? C, is it lost pay? How about D, home health aids for companionship when you go through this process? And B is the correct answer, the cost of finding the proper kidney for your transplant surgery. Good job. Now we'll turn it back over to Peter to continue with the presentation. Thank you. So now we're gonna move over to lesson four, which is Medicare coverage options for people with end-stage renal disease. Sorry, I suppressed my video there. So this lesson, 
um, we're going to be able to, at the end of this lesson, we're going to be able to explain uh, Medicare supplemental insurance, uh, Medigap options and considerations for people with end-stage renal disease, explain how Medicare Advantage plan options and considerations that people may have with end-stage renal disease, and explain the Medicare drug uh, plan options and considerations for people with end-stage renal disease. So end-stage renal disease and Medicare supplemental insurance known as Medigap. Why consider a Medigap policy? Medigap help pays for some healthcare costs that original Medicare doesn't cover. Can people under 65 with ESRD buy a Medigap policy? It depends. Not all insurance companies will sell policies to people under the age of 65. Uh, do rules differ by whatever state you your patient is um, in? Um, yes. Um, there, the, each rule has a different. Um, where can I learn more about Medigap? You would contact your state insurance department or your state health insurance assistance program, also known as SHIP. And uh, in yesterday, if you've been in other um, uh, national training program um, um, courses, you will see that SHIP is talked about very often as a go-to place um, to find out about Medigap options. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about end-stage renal disease and Medicare Advantage plans. So why would, why would you consider a Medicare Advantage plan? Well, Medicare Advantage plans may offer extra coverage like dental, hearing, and vision um, not related to the patient's end-stage renal disease. Can people with end-stage renal disease join a Medicare Advantage plan? Yes, they can. How might it affect their costs, rights, and protections and choices? Using a once you sign up for a Medicare Advantage plan, you're going to be using a network of providers. Plans can charge different out-of-pocket costs. And if you want to find out more about uh, the fine print with a uh, Medicare Advantage plan, you, you may want to sign up. Or before you sign up, contact the plan. Uh, find out or you can visit our medicare.gov plan compare site on medicare.gov. Um, and where can you learn more about Medicare Advantage plans in your state or in your county? You would go to medicare.gov to the uh, Medicare sponsored website and go to plan compare, check it out. Now I'd like to switch yet another gear to um, end stage renal disease and Medicare drug coverage. So if you have end-stage renal disease, uh, do, uh, are you eligible for Medicare drug coverage under Medicare Part D? Everyone with Medicare is eligible to get Medicare drug coverage. And how do you get that coverage? If you have original Medicare, you join a plan to get the cover drug coverage. If you join a Medicare Advantage plan with drug coverage, then you'll get your drug coverage through that plan. Can I get help paying for Medicare drug coverage? You may be able to get um, extra help to pay for your Medicare drug costs. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. It's time for our final knowledge check poll question. So you know what to do. Question is, people with end-stage renal disease or ESRD can choose original Medicare or a Medicare Advantage plan to get their Medicare coverage. Is that true or false? The correct answer is A, true. Since January 1st of 2021, people with ESRD can get their Medicare coverage either through original Medicare or a Medicare Advantage plan. So well done. And now we'll go ahead and pass things back to Peter to finish out our presentation.
Now we're going to move to the uh, additional information or the resource. And so I noticed there was a, a link showing that you you can actually get a copy of this um, um, of this series of slides. And there's a bunch of resources here, which uh, we're going to be going through. So uh, this objective is um, to, the objective of this lesson is to um, describe uh, advancing American Kidney Health Initiative and its purpose, uh, describing the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the agency that uh, we work for, um, the specialty care models and what's their purpose, and describe how CMS evaluates the quality of care at dialysis facilities, and then describe the end-stage renal disease National Coordinating Center and what is its purpose, and then uh, describe the Fistula First Initiative and what is it its purpose. So um, CMS innovation payment models um, are for to, to transform uh, kidney care. So we have two models. We have a mandatory model um, for end-stage renal disease treatment choices. Um, to encourage greater use of home dialysis and kidney transplants. These payment adjustments are from um, January 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2027. And then there's an optional model, which is called the kidney care choices model, which includes that the kidney care first and the comprehensive kidney care con contracting options to promote coordinated care. And those payment options are April 1st to 2021, all the way to December 31st, 2025. Um, as far as dialysis facilities, CMS uses quality measures to evaluate dialysis facilities each year. Um, they're required to display um, scores in an area easy for you to find and to format and language in a format and language for you to understand. Scores can range from zero to 100 and are based on how to take how the facility is performed on the quality measures. Um, then we have the end stage renal disease networks. And these are available to help. Uh, so these are national networks respons responsible for each state, territory, and district of Columbia. Um, they develop by criteria and standards related to the quality and appropriateness of care for end-stage renal disease patients. They resolve complaints and grievances uh, within, the, within the dialysis facilities. And then there are also chief purposes to educate people with Medicare about Medicare and your Medicare coverage. So I really encourage um, um, if as your as your family is about to deal with um, your loved P ESRD patient that you get hooked in to one of the end stage renal disease networks um, for your state and um, get that they can provide an awful lot of assistance helping you navigate um, your end-stage renal disease care. Um, a big initiative uh, that um, CMS is supporting is the Fistula First, known as the National Vascular Access Improvement Initiative. And on the right is the picture and the tag for um, Fistula First. Um, the quality improvement project is conducted by all ESRD networks, and it promotes the use of art arteriovenous fistulas in providing hemodialysis for suitable dialysis patients. So some key points I'm going to be leaving you with. End-stage renal disease is permanent kidney failure. You can get Medicare no matter how old you are, if your kidneys no longer work, you need regular dialysis or have a kidney transplant, and one of the following points apply to you or to your loved one. You've worked the required amount under Social Security or the Railroad Retirement Board or as a government employee. You're already getting or eligible for Social Security or Railroad Retirement benefits, 
You're the spouse or dependent child of a person who meets either of the two requirements I just said. So you're married or a, or a dependent child. Once you have Medicare coverage because of end-stage renal disease, usually the fourth month of the dialysis, your group health plan will pay first on your hospital and medical bills for 30 months, whether or not you have Medicare or not. If you have end-stage renal disease, you can get your Medicare coverage through original Medicare or the Medicare or a Medicare Advantage plan. Transplant drugs, also known as immunosuppressive drugs, are only covered by Medicare Part B, medical insurance, or people who were entitled to Medicare Part A, hospital insurance, at the time of the kidney transplant. In the old days, we used to say, did Medicare participate in the transplant? So there's a new Part B immunosuppressive drug coverage beyond the 36 month post transplant period if you don't have other certain types of coverage. So now I'm gonna to move to the resource guide. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, you can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and uh, it, it operates in both English and Spanish terrifically. Um, uh, you can contact Medicare.gov. Medicare.gov is our beneficiary facing, our patient facing website for families and their and, and, and the pa their patients. Um, CMS.gov is the um, provider facing and the policy uh, facing part of Medicare.gov, and that's where you're going to find all our training materials on CMS.gov. Um, Social Security um, is, uh, this is their um, uh, 1-800 line, and um, they're open until, um, I believe, from 6 in the morning till 8 at night, so they're not 24-7, but practically. Um, and uh, their, their website is ssa.gov. Um, so for the social uh, security immunosuppressive drug benefit, you would call again the 1-800-4-6-6-6. Um, um, I did mention about the state health insurance assistance program. There's a nifty website, one-stop shop. You can call um, SHIP Help. Um, you can also, also call 1-800-MEDICARE and say, um, I would like my, I need some local help. And that will also get you to the state health insurance assistance program. And then the end stage renal disease national coordinating center is, uh, the link is right there, esrdncc.org. Um, the national kidney education program is on the link on the right. I don't think I'm going to read that all, but uh, there's a um, notice that the National Kidney um, Education Program is a .gov um, site. Um, the ESRD network's contact information, like, like I mentioned, the ESRD network and how they're very good for um, ESRD patients and their families to work with. Um, this is where you can find the contact information if you don't know the ESRD network in your in your state. Um, and you're, if you're curious about the fistula uh, first catheter last um, uh, initiative, um, it is a, um, it's, it's a website. It, it, that, that's the link there. Again, I'm, it's too long for me to read at this point, but esrdncc.org. Um, so it's a .org website. Um, the National Kidney Foundation, again, kidney.org is an .org website. Uh, the American Kidney Fund, um, and that is a .org website. Uh, United Network for Organ Sharing, um, also a .org website. And then uh, in cms.gov, uh, remember, I said this was more of the, the, the beneficiary and policy facing part, website from CMS. Is the end stage renal disease Medicare medical evidence report, medic, Medicare entitlement, and or patient registration form. So this is the form that, um, that you need to get filled out. So that's the hot link to get the form. 
Um, so to, um, these are um, for you, the um, end, stage, end stage renal disease resource guide. Um, these are the actual Medicare publications. And so I just wanted to go through these um, very quickly, just so you knew they existed. Um, so uh, on the right is the CMS product number. So you can get these at several different ways. So one way, if you just need one, you can call 1-800-MEDICARE and say, hey, I need CMS product number um, 10128, and they'll mail you one or print it out and then mail it to you. But um, so the, the ones that are offered are um, me, uh, Medicare coverage for kidney dialysis and kidney transplant services, um, Medicare for children and end stage with end stage renal disease, how to get started, Medicare coverage of dialysis and kidney transplant benefits, getting started, Medicare coverage of ambulance services, um, the Medicare and You uh, Handbook, which your ESRD beneficiaries, as soon as they sign up for Medicare, will start beginning every year. That's a very important handbook. And then Medicare Advantage plans and how they're available for people with end-stage renal disease. Um, because most of us on this call are um, partners, are Medicare partners and are in the business of um, doing patient education, um, I'm going to encourage you to check out our publication ordering system. And so you go to, uh, as part as a partner, you go onto the um, productordering.cms.hhs.gov, set up an account. It's very much like Amazon. You set up an account. You must register the organization that you're working with, and then you are able to order, um, you know, these publications, and they'll come to you. Um, I would just make the cautionary statement of, you know, don't over order, don't order pallets of information. Usually the publication ordering warehouse would like you to maybe buy, you know, maybe order a box or 50 uh, or 50 uh, publications uh, for your use. But then after you order them, remember to check out and it'll come in. But I do encourage you as a partner to, um, if you think what you take a look at one of these books, think they might be useful for your work, um, they're available. Um, I'm not going to read all these, but because I, hopefully I, I did not use any acronyms uh, in the ESRD sphere, um, this is a cheat sheet that is great for all new employees and new folks um, who are just entering this um, new um, universe of end-stage renal disease. These are all the um, you know, um, acronyms that I hopefully didn't use. I, I guess I used one saying SHIP, which stands for State Health Insurance Assistance Program, or Railroad Retirement Board, RRB. Um, or yeah, if you look to the left corner of my uh, projection on, on your screen, it says NTP. Well, what does that stand for? National Training Program. So this is a cheat sheet um, just to have, because a lot of times in, in CMS or in Medicare, we'll use abbreviations, and this is to help you. Um, and so um, we are coming to the end here, and we're going to move over to the questions and answer portion of our um, of our um, our presentation. All right, thank you so much, Peter, and also Brenda. As Peter mentioned, we are at the time that we are going to answer some of the questions that you have been submitting into the Q and A live. Um, and I've been watching what you've submitted. And of course, you know, ESRD is a, a complicated at times topic from the policy side. So some of your questions look a little bit complicated as well. I'm going to do my very best to read these a little bit slowly and very carefully to make sure that everyone understands the question and give our subject matter experts um, a clear a clear um, question to respond to. So with that, I'm going to start off. Um, David Santana, who's my colleague with NTP, I have a question for you. And it is, um, after 30 months, does coverage stop for immunosuppressive drugs? Thanks, Melissa. And uh, 
Um, I, I select a few questions in there that I thought it would be good for everyone to answer live so everyone hear the answer and and you know and allow us an opportunity to uh to provide some clarifications and uh and you know brenda or peter uh feel free to chime in after my explanation if you have anything else to add but with regards to um the 30 month coordination uh period and i think the question has to do with okay so a plan if you are enrolled in a group health plan regardless of how many employees that plan have, and regardless whether that plan is based on, on current employment or is a retired plan, if you are enrolling in Medicare uh, solely because of ESRD, that plan will be primary for 30 month coordination period. So again, it doesn't matter whether the plan has uh, you know, five employees or 150 employees. That plan will be primary, and it doesn't matter whether the plan is if, is based in retirement already. So this is different from our general coordination of benefits rule, right? That we look at the at the number of employees to determine whether Medicare is primary or secondary. So with regards to ESRD, again, it doesn't matter the size of the employer, and it doesn't matter whether it's based on current employment or retirement. That plan will be primary for 30 month coordination period. Now you heard Brenda explaining this, but you don't, you know, you become eligible for Medicare if you're getting dialysis, you become eligible for Medicare the, uh, uh, the first uh, date of the fourth month of you getting dialysis, or if you get in at home, it, it starts right away, it, or depends on when you, get, when you get a kidney transplant is when your Medicare begins. Now, whether you enrolled in Medicare or not, this 30-month coordination period kicks off at the moment that you become el uh, eligible for Medicare, right? Now, at the end of that 30-month coordination period, uh, that plan has the ability to tell you now Medicare is primary. And so if you don't enroll in Medicare, we would pay as if Medicare was your primary policy, right? Meaning that they will pick up what you know, the typical Medicare coverage, for example, if we're talking about immunosuppressant drugs, Medicare covers 80% and you're responsible for 20%. So it's not that the plan will stop paying for your immunosuppressant drugs at the end of the 30 month coordination period, but that if you don't enroll in Medicare, they can tell you, well, uh, because you don't, uh, you don't enroll in Medicare, we will only pay the 20% after what Medicare would have paid. Right, so the plan is not going to change their benefits. The only thing that they will change is the fact that if you do not enroll in Medicare at the end of the uh, 30 month coordination period, um, the plan could pay as if Medicare was primary. So what is that? what would be the best thing to do uh, with regards to the 30 month coordination period? If you want to delay enrollment in Medicare because your plan will be primary for all that time and you think that paying that premium may not be a good return for your investment, uh, we recommend that you delay enrollment in Medicare Part A and Part B. That way, the, uh, at the end of that 30-month coordination period, you can just go ahead and jump into Medicare um, and, and start uh, Medicare will begin uh, when Medicare becomes uh, the primary, right? Uh, let's say that you have an, that, you know, the 30-month coordination period came, and then three months later, you find out that the plan is now telling you, hey, you need to be enrolled in Medicare. Remember that Brenda says that when, when you enroll in Medicare based on ESRD, you can take your, your uh, enrollment retroactive. Uh, in this case, if you find out you know, that your 30 month coordination period ended uh, in December last year, and you find it, uh, you finding that out now, you can, go ahead and enroll in Medicare and take that enrollment retroactive to that time. You have the ability to take Part A retroactive to that time uh, because Part A is free. Uh, and you have the option to take Part B retroactive to the time that you get Part A or to get it when you signed up for Medicare at this, at this time, right? Like if you, you signed up in August, you can get Part B starting in August. Uh, or you can get it retroactive to December in, in that example. 
you know, but keep it in mind that you do have to pay the back premium for Medicare uh, Part B back premium back to uh, to December. So I hope that that clarifies how the the thirty month coordination period worked and how the Medicare uh, enrollment works at the end of that coordination period. What we do not recommend is that if individual is to delay enrollment in, in, in Medicare, not just to take part A and delay part B, because then you will not qualify for a Medicare special enrollment period, right? So if you only take part A and don't enroll in part B, you can only do so during the general enrollment period. So you do have to wait until you know, January through March and enroll during that time, and you could possibly pay a penalty for not signing up when you should have. Um, so again, uh, I think the trick in here is that if you're going to delay Medicare, delay part A and B so you can sign up at any time and take a retroactive back to 12 months. Because if you only take part A, then to take part B later, you, then you're gonna have to wait until the general enrollment period. And uh, I, I hope that that provides some clarification with regards to uh, to the 31 coordination period and option for enrolling in Medicare. And uh, um, I think we're ready for the next question, Melissa. Thank you so much, David. That was a really great detailed explanation of the coordination period and a lot of timing considerations and cost considerations. So thank you very much for that. Our next question uh, is regarding transplant drugs. Does it mean that if you don't take part A or part B at the same time um, of the transplant or within 12 months after the time of the transplant, that Part D will never cover them later on once you do have Medicare? So, um, so to answer this question again, let's provide some, uh, again, uh, piggybacking on, uh, on the explanation uh, during Brenda's presentation about consideration for uh, immunosuppressant drugs. So uh, if you go, I think if you go back to the slide, um, uh, I think it was a slide number uh, 20, um, so there are only two basic requirements to qualify for Medicare to pay for immunosuppressant drugs. One is that you had to have you have to be enrolled in Part A at the time you get the transplant, and the second one is that you had uh, your transplant surgery had to be in a Medicare uh, certified facility, right? So those are the two basic requirements. You have to be enrolled in Part A at the time of the transplant, and the transplant had to be taking place in a Medicare certified facility. If you do not, let's say you did not enroll in Medicare Part A at the time of your transplant, uh, or let's say you did your transplant uh, took place in a facility that wasn't Medicare certified. Now, even if you enroll in Part B at this uh, at this time. Um, Let's say your transplant took place uh, back in, uh, you know, uh, February of uh, of last year. Um, let's say that you enroll in Medicare um, Medicare Part A and B now, um, and you can't take it retroactive back to your transplant. So even if you enroll in Medicare Part A and B, you do not meet the requirement, right? Uh, because you were not enrolled in Part A at the time of the transplant. So if you do enroll in Part D. Part D uh, will cover your drugs. Because again, even if you enroll in Part B, you do not meet the, the, uh, the requirement for immunosuppressant drug coverage. So to answer the question in here is that um, uh, in terms of a transplant, do does it mean that you did not take Part A and Part B at the time of the transplant or 12 months, um, Part D will never cover uh, the, uh, the drug. Uh, no, it doesn't mean that. So if you if you did not have Part A at the time of your transplant, you do not meet the requirement. That means that you can enroll in Part D, and they will pay for the immunosuppressant drugs. But at the same time, let's say that uh, you did have Part A at the time of the transplant, but um, you decided not to enroll in Part B. So if you do enroll in Part B, then Part B will cover your drugs, right? So in that case. Let's say you only have part A and you didn't 
enroll in Part D and enroll in a, in a prescription drug plan. So in, in that case, Part D will say, well, all you need to do to get Part B to cover your drug is enroll in Part B because you do qualify to have Part B to pay for it, right? Because you were enrolled in Part A at the time you get the transplant. So Part D will say, no, we're not going to cover your drugs. You should go ahead and enroll in Part B, and they will cover your drugs. That would be the instance that, that Part D will say, no, because you qualify under Medicare Part B. All you have to do is enroll to get it. I hope that, that clarifies that, Melissa. And just jump to the next question. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate, and I'm sure others do as well, you referencing the specific slide um, to answer that question. And I really get the sense that uh, because the immunosuppressive anti-transplant rejection drugs are so very important, uh, Medicare looks like between Part B and Part D has gone through a lot of care to make coverage available to folks one way or the other. I mean, there are rules and they, they sound kind of tricky, but thank you for that explanation. So our next question is, if an individual is going to be the living donor for her adult child who is currently on community and employment support waiver through Medicaid, are they skipping dialysis? dialysis and going straight to transplant? And when would be the proper time to apply, apply for Medicare? Excuse me. So David, maybe you can address this. It seems to be a little complicated. Sure. Um, so uh, again, going, going back to the, uh, um, I think it was back in the slide 15 of the presentation that Brenda explained uh, when Medicare coverage begins. Uh, depending on whether you get dialysis or you get a transplant. So in this case, um, an individual says, you know, I, uh, an individual is diagnosed with end-stage renal disease, and instead of going uh, uh, into dialysis, they're just waiting to get the transplant. And many people, uh, you know, get into this, especially when they're younger children, that they may just go straight to the transplant because they have an immediate uh, donor, um, you know, for the for example, a parent here that just wanted to donate uh, a kidney right away, that person can jump straight to get the uh, the transplant. And Brenda explained back on, if you look at the slide 15, when can you get Medicare uh, because of uh, a kidney transplant? So you can get Medicare the first date of the of the month. Um, they this person will get the the kidney transplant. Uh, um, uh, the same month uh, you are admitted to the hospital to uh, to start getting prepared for the kidney transplant, assuming that the transplant will will happen within the next uh, two months, or if it doesn't happen within the next two months, uh, you can get it two months before the month you get a transplant. Uh, so, uh, so to answer this individual question is uh, uh, yes, uh, because this person have an immediate donor that's going to jump straight to the transplant, and Medicare could begin. Uh, Again, depending on whether they get into the hospital to start getting prepared, uh, like you know, two months before the transplant happen, um, or the same month that they get a transplant, if you just go in right away and, and get the transplant. I hope that clarifies that question. Yes, it did. Thank you very much. So our next question is. Why does the current Medigap plans and benefits chart neglect to mention ESRD? Could you address that, please, David? So um, a little bit about uh, Medigap policies and ESRD. So they, they, you know, the vast majority of people that are in ESRD are under age 65, and federal law does not require Medigap policies to be sold to individuals uh, who are under 65, whether they are getting Medicare because of a disability or because of uh, end-stage renal disease. Uh, however, states do have flexibilities to uh, to uh, to require Medigap policies to be sold uh, to individuals under 65. They, you know, some states require at least one policy. Some of them 
are specific to individuals with ESRD. Some of them are just specific to individuals who's getting Medicare because of the disability, or some of them require an either case. Um, but not all of the estates offer this additional uh, flexibility or requirements for mega policy to be sold to those individual. So I think because it's not really if uh, you know mandated by federal law that a policy be, will be sold to individuals under 65, it is handled state by state. Um, so you do need to check with your state, and sometimes these policies are not widely advertised. Um, because of the, they're not really required. And again, even in those states that are required, uh, they are not, uh, they're, they're, they don't open all Medigap policies, but they only requires maybe one, one kind of policy. Uh, for example, locally here, I think they, they went the state in Maryland, they, they only require plan A to be sold to those individuals. Um, so that's why they, they may not be widely publicized. Okay, great. Thank you again. So, David, you marked that you would like to respond to this next question, and I'm a little unclear about the way it's phrased, but I think you know what they're getting at. So here's the question. For patients who were enrolled into Medicare due to ESRD, but not qualified due to residency, how do they disenroll? So if uh, if a person who were enrolled in Medicare due to ESRD, but they uh, they don't have a, uh, a a immigration status, meaning that Medicare will not uh, pay because of their immigration status. They can just uh, I mean disenrollment from Medicare is 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 easy. Um, you just uh, contact Social Security and indicate that. You know, you don't want to be enrolled in Medicare specifically if you, you know, if you if you don't meet the requirement for Medicare payment. Um, obviously, Medicare is not paying. Uh, so even if it's even if you're enrolled in Part A and B, um, Medicare is not paying. Uh, there's nothing to be paid back, and because usually when you are entitled to the benefits, for example, if you're getting Part A and B to terminate. Um, to withdraw uh, to terminate Medicare, um, you have to withdraw the uh, the application. And sometimes, if Medicare paid anything, Medicare Part A, you have to repay that back. But in the case of an individual that doesn't meet the residency requirement, um, um, you can just go ahead and disenroll. You can contact Social Security, and they'll provide instruction about how to submit a, a disenrollment application. I hope that I'm interpreting the question correct, but it seems to me that the individual is asking uh, for those who don't qualify because of the um, immigration status or residency requirement. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. When I saw residency, I thought it might be related to re um, immigration status, but I wasn't quite sure. So thank you for thoroughly um, addressing at least that, that aspect of the question. Um, and we hope that that's what they were asking. So I do have a couple of foundational level questions um, that, of course, David, you're welcome to answer, and also William, because um, we've had some complicated questions, but we also need to make sure that everyone's clear on the basics. So the next question is, are Part D plans required to cover immunosuppressive drugs on their formularies? Part D, if you enroll in Part D, they are required to cover immunosuppressant drugs. That's one of the, uh, one of the, I think there are six protected categories of drugs, and uh, immunosuppressant drugs are one of those categories that all Part D plans are required to cover. Wonderful. Thank you. Our next question is, just for clarification, if Medicare starts on the first day of the fourth month after starting dialysis, they will not get retroactive coverage for those first four months? I mean, Brenda can speak to this because she, she addresses that, but um, uh, I think that it was, it was clear in there that during that first three months uh, of waiting for Medicare entitlement, you are only 
you are only covered. If you do have an employer plan, that will be your only covered uh, coverage. If you don't have any any coverage during that time, you could, you know, apply. It depends on your income and resources. You could apply for Medicaid. Um, you could also uh, seek uh, coverage through a a marketplace. Um, you know, assuming that you are within the enrollment period. Um, but during that, that you know, that during that three month waiting period, there's really not Medicare retroactive coverage for that for that time that you're waiting, um, because Medicare started the fourth month of dialysis. The only thing that we that I would recommend is that the, if the individual could do could participate in the home dialysis training, Medicare will start right away. So that that would be my um, um, my suggestion. Okay, Brenda, do you want to add anything or we can just go to the next question? No, just that last part, that home dialysis is a workaround because Medicare does start immediately if the patient is willing to do home dialysis. And that includes uh, completing the train, uh, starting the training with the expectation of completing the training. Um, so maybe they could transition from home dialysis to another form of dialysis but home dialysis does allow Medicare coverage immediately. Wonderful. Thank you for that explanation, Brenda. All right. So I'm glad that you brought up um, Marketplace, David, because we have a question that um, speaks to this Marketplace and Medicare world. And the question is, for people with Marketplace coverage, um, through the ACA, obviously, and ESRD, they have Medicare. So they have Marketplace and they have Medicare coverage. Is there any coordination um, between those types of coverage? If you have a Marketplace plan, um, can you have the Marketplace plan cover your ESRD without having Medicare? So solely, maybe Marketplace could take care of your ESRD needs and treatment coverage? So ESRD is one of um, so you could have you could choose to uh, to a state to a state enroll in your marketplace plan um, after becoming eligible for Medicare um, because of ESRD or because um, you have to pay for Medicare Part A premium in those two instances the individual could potentially keep their marketplace plan. And if they were getting premium tax credits and co-sharing reduction, they could keep that uh, with, uh, they could keep the marketplace plan only without enrolling in Medicare. Um, the moment you do enroll in Medicare, however, let's say that an individual has a marketplace plan and they develop uh, end-stage renal disease, they decide to enroll in Medicare uh, at the moment that Medicare takes place, then the premium tax credit and co-sharing reduction goes away. So the individual will be required to pay the full premium uh, if they were getting any assistance. Once the individual enrolled in Medicare, Medicare would become automatically the primary payer um, and the marketplace will be secondary. Is there a coordination of benefits between the two? No, not in general. You don't have coordination between Medicare and that plan. Medicare will pay primary, and then you know the individual or the doctor could file the the uh, what's left to the plan, and it depends on on, on their plan um, uh, you, you know agreement. Uh, they may or may not pay it, um, after Medicare. But there is there isn't really a a direct coordination of benefits that it exists with. Uh, with other payers um, that we typically coordinate benefits with, for example, Medigap policy, individual who have Medicaid, TRICARE, um, individual who have federal employee health benefits program that we have uh, automatic uh, crossover process with them. We don't have such process with the marketplace plan. So again, uh, it would be up to the individual or the doctor to file after Medicare and see if the plan agree to reimburse something. Oh, thank you so much. Um, you know, it's just really 
uh, a lot of questions coming in about coordination. Um, so there are nuances to um, the ESRD coverage topic. And in fact, the next question speaks to coordination between Medicare and Medicaid. So if someone is under the age of 65 and is diagnosed with ESRD and they're receiving dialysis, but they did not enroll in Medicare because they have Medicaid, when can they enroll in Medicare and does it coordinate with Medicaid at that point? So again, it's, uh, it's if an individual uh, become eligible for Medicare because of end stage renal disease and they were in Medicaid, um, it depends it depends on how the state treats this. For some states, for example, may may require that if you have Medicaid, that you would enroll in Medicare when you become eligible uh, due to ESRD. Uh, usually when the states requires an individual to enroll in Medicare, they will um, they will pay their Medicare uh, premium. You know, specifically in this case, usually uh, if you do qualify for Medicare based on ESRD, and they said, now you have to enroll in Medicare, they would have to pay your Medicare premium. They can't say, uh, just enroll in Medicare and not pay anything. The only, uh, the only instance that the state can require an individual to enroll in Medicare is that if they agree to pay their premium, right? Because they, uh, they're enrolled in Medicaid already. Um, but if there is no such a thing, if, if they are enrolled in a Medicaid group, that they don't include on, on what we call the state buy-in, whereby the state pay the Medicare premium, then the state cannot require them to enroll in Medicare. It would be up to the member to do it. And uh, is there a coordination between Medicare and Medicaid? Absolutely. Uh, when the person has the two program, we both work together. Um, and you know when Medicare process the claim, usually Medicare will be primary it goes automatically uh, to the state to cover, um, um, you know, to pay after Medicare. And, and again, remember that Medicaid have different groups of individuals that are falls into the program, whether, uh, whether it's because of the disease or because of, uh, um, uh, because of individual age, a disability, um, because of it's a, it's, a, it's a minor. So there are different groups that, that falls into the Medicaid category. Um, and if they fall within that category that they will pay the premium for Medicare, then they would require Medicare enrollment. If they don't, then it's up to the individual to sign up for Medicare when they have Medicaid. Um, so I hope that that provides some, some clarification on how the two programs um, work together. Oh, yes, it does. Thank you. That's very good clarification. And in fact, I think we are going to take our last question. Um, and this is one that you also, Mark, David, that you'd like to answer live. And it is a little complicated, but I'm going to read it. I, I think you're familiar with this already. Okay, so if a person, number one, is enrolled in ESRD um, and has Medicare, um, they're enrolled in Medicare through ESRD, but they wish to defer due to employer group health plan coverage, then they ask social security to withdraw as it was not wanted, but SSA only withdraws part B, not part A, and the employer group health plan later ends due to loss of employment, do they have, do they not have the seven month SEP to sign up for part B due to the loss of the active employment group health plan coverage? Or do they have to wait for the GEP? You know, that's, the, the, that's a, a great question. I, I, and I think I, I provide some clarifications about this uh, before. And the fact that if, you, uh, only, if you're only eligible for Medicare because of ESRD and you have an an employer group health plan, regardless of the size of the employer, regardless of whether you are working or retired, that plan is primary to Medicare for 30 month coordination period. Um, if you choose to, in this case, the person is saying, 
what if the person just terminate Medicare Part B? Um, they enrolled in, in only Medicare, Medi Medicare Part A. They did not take Part B or, or they took Part A and B and then they call later and say, hey, I wanted to withdraw Medicare, but only Part B was terminated. Um, once that that uh, em, that employer plan uh, ends, whether whether you you stayed in the employer plan through the end of the thirty month coordination period or that plan suddenly ends, that individual do not qualify for a special enrollment period because an individual with ESRD doesn't have a special enrollment period that everyone else has, right? So if you do enroll in Part A only and you defer Part B, uh, remember that the only time that you would that you will be able to sign up is during the general enrollment period. So the answer to this question is yes. In this case, the individual will have to wait until the general enrollment period because they only took Part A um, and they did not enroll in Part B when they took Part A. Remember what I said in my in my explanation prior to uh, to this one that if you're going to defer enrollment uh, in Medicare due to ESRD, uh, don't take Medicare Part A and B. Right, deferred enrollment in both Part A and B because if that was the case, if this person would have terminated Part A and B, and then the employer plan ends. Um, or is the end of the 30 month coordination period, that person can just jump into Medicare Part A and B, uh, no waiting period, no penalty, and they could take Medicare retroactive up to 12 months. So I hope that clarifies that. Yes, I appreciate it. I know that you have, um, in addition to our wonderful presenters who have covered um, this coordination period and timing to enroll, um, reinforcing those points is really helpful because there's a lot to know with the timing um, and the considerations with enrolling and making sure that you have the coverage you need when you need it. So thank you for the clarifications, um, David, and also to all of our presenters because we have reached the end of our Q&A and that concludes today's workshop. So I want to thank our presenters, Peter Bauer and Brenda Delgado, as well as William Harris and David Santana, who helped respond to some of your questions during the presentation today. Remember that you can download the slides and materials from our website, the same place that you launched this course. And finally, you can email us at training at cms.hhs.gov. And that includes some of the questions that if you had submitted in the Q&A and it didn't get answered, go ahead and send that to our training mailbox. Thank you to everyone who attended today, and thanks to everyone who's attended um, some of our other NTP virtual workshops this year. We look forward to receiving your evaluations so we can start planning the 2024 NTP workshops. Enjoy the rest of your day.